Hey everyone. <laughs> hey, Contra, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank yeah. you. Uh, we figured the way we would do this is kind of just, uh, we'll just be riffing off each other. It'll not be a super formal interview with like hard questions. I have topics with like suggested questions, but we'll just see where it goes. I mean, we want it to be organic. Uh, kind of like an in-person live stream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to start t uh, the event off talking about how we got here because it, it's kind of germane to uh, the whole what's been on our minds about how do we navigate ourselves within, you know, pub being public figures in this political sphere with all the uh, disparate political factions and some not so savory than others. Um, but this event was, we, there was quite a bit of turmoil and tumultuous times uh, because uh, your audience kind of, or a large portion of your audience quite turned on you when you announced it, uh, specifically because of the presence of a uh, conservative trans commentator, uh, Blair White. And I kind of want to ask you, what went down and why do you think that went down and then maybe we can go from there. Yeah, so this is really a continuation of a problem that I've had for a few months now on YouTube or just existing in a political space on social media. Um, it started a couple months ago when I did an interview for New York Magazine with the journalist Jesse Single, who is considered by a lot of trans people to be transphobic and I'm not going to comment on whether or not that's the case. But basically my doing an interview with him became a cause of major hostility towards me from a lot of other trans people. Um, you know, and I got defensive about it. I did that thing that we all do on Twitter where you just like lash out at everyone who dogpiles you. Double down. I double down, yeah. yeah. Um, managed to heal that and then of course this event comes out. Mm -hmm. And the idea, the idea that my whole audience turned against me, that's not really what happened. Um, a lot of people on Twitter are I wouldn't really quite consider them fans because all they do with respect to talking to me now is criticize me in an extremely vitriolic term. So these are not these are fans. Right. But like, I think that the frustration is that legitimate criticism or well-meaning criticism gets mixed together with half-truths, with exaggerations, um, with outright falsehoods until the point where the story being passed around leftist Twitterverse was contrapoints is doing fundraising for a Nazi event. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I mean, there's, st like, there's still corners of Twitter where people are go, go around spreading this. And I've, I have these frustrating interactions where I say like, you know, I see someone saying this, yeah, but she did this. She like, but didn't she raise money for Holocaust deniers? And, like, <laughs> and then I, I'll start correcting them. And, and, and then I get to this frustrating point where I say like, like this never happened. I point to all the evidence that it never happened, and then they say, "Like, well, you should have done a better job communicating with your fans that you weren't raising money for for the, the Fourth Reich." And it's like, you know, so on the one hand, it's an intensely frustrating as someone on the left who tries to have these kinds of conversations or who tries not to just stick to my own corner of Twitter. But on the other hand, I'm frustrated that a lot of people are very interested in the story about leftists turn on their own, mm. or the story of like leftists shut down free speech, leftists shut down dialogue. And uh, you know, when, when this happens to me, a bunch of journalists show up and they want to suddenly, they, don't, they never talk to me except when something like this happens, they suddenly want to talk to me because they know that they can tell this story about crazy campus SJWs. And I don't want to be part of that story being told, to be honest, because I think it's not the most important story going on right now. But it's a story that a lot of people are intensely interested in telling. Mm. Well, the thing is, I think that that is, it isn't your audience or the majority of your audience, certainly not, but it, I do think it represents a certain, a certain faction within the left. Um, and the, what's, what's unfortunate to me is like you do such great work for the left in terms of uh, giving them good arguments, uh, giving them good ways of thinking about things and mobilizing them. And I feel like things like that definitely uh, slow, uh, slow the left down in terms of it demobilizes them um, and it just creates this infighting and can't focus on the bigger picture. 
But you said there were some legitimate criticisms. I'm, I'm just curious to get to those uh, because I don't think that you believe that, uh, you know, kind of the... You're not completely sold on the whole free marketplace of ideas. Any idea should, you know, be given a platform anywhere uh, um, at any time uh, and so forth. So I think there's something to be said for exercising discretion when it comes to what kinds of events or what we have on college campuses or what kinds of speakers we bring to college campuses. There are some speakers who, because of their intensely, let's just say, bigoted views, mm -hmm. They simply bringing them onto campus sort of threatens the campus mission of being an inclusive space, a place that is, in some basic sense, safe for people and where they think they're not going to um, you know, be subjected to intense hostility on the basis of their gender or the basis of their race or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when it, when it comes uh, to take a more extreme example than anything considered here, mm -hmm. Is it a good idea to bring Richard Spencer to campus? No, it's not. Um, and I don't think that, he, you know, I think that if I were to do an event like that, people would be justified in criticizing me. Or there's at least a case to be made. Mm. Um, now, unfortunately, no one ever seems content to limit what they say to that. And everything always has to go from zero to 60 with people on the internet. Yes. And so it can't just be... On Twitter, especially. Right. It can't just be, I think this is an ill-conceived idea. I, can't, I think this is an ill-conceived event. It has to go straight to, why are you enabling the rise of fascism? You know, like, like there's, there's not a measured version of yeah. this. Or there is a measured version of this, but it gets drowned out. You know, and it's, yeah. as a person who's subjected to this kind of criticism, it's difficult to listen to the measured version of it when you're also being accused of colluding with Nazis. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think where people are in this centrist and also center right right wingers, where they come from in terms of like hosting Richard Spencer is like you know the whole free market of like place of ideas platitude. Mm -hmm. um, I think what they get wrong is it, like that is true for like an, an, a purely intellectual space, which no no space in this world is a purely intellectual space. It's the real world with real consequences. Um, you can't separate the ideas from the effect it has on the people and the subtext it carries within a social political context. And what I was running through this, this kind of thought in my head and I was imagining, I was listening to a bunch of Ben Shapiro stuff on trans people and just how shitty, deeply, <laughs> deeply, deeply shitty it is. Um, regardless of his supposed rationalizations, just the real world effect it has. Mm -hmm. it, it gives so many people reason to just misgender trans people online, in person, um, and to uh, investigate their identity and pick it apart, right? Um, and I was just thinking to myself, like, imagine like this trans girl who's going on campus trying to have a good learning environment, a good experience, trying to engage with ideas, and she hears that some of her classmates organized to have Ben Shapiro come on and talk about, you know, transgenderism. Just that knowing that she is surrounded by those people is inherently hostile. Like, I understand that. Like, I could imagine what that must be like. That can't, yeah. and, and that, in a very real sense, that impedes on, for example, in this experiment, her learning experience and the learning environment and engaging with ideas and so pretending like like Ben Shapiro coming on on campus and talking uh, spout, spouting pretty shitty things doesn't have a real world effect on how other people can engage in the in the free marketplace of ideas and, and in a learning environment I think is foolish and a little bit naive yeah I totally agree with that um, I think that to anticipate what's going to be the objection. The objection to that is going to be that, well, people, these kids just need to grow up and understand that there's people who are hostile to them. The world's not a safe space, so you know, get over the fact that some people are, have opinions that are bigoted towards you. Okay, on some level as pragmatic advice, that's true. Like, we both know that if you're gonna be trans, you're just gonna have to deal with some people being terrible yeah. about it. Um, and everyone who's trans just has to deal with that. Um, on the other hand, when you're deciding which speakers to bring to your university, um, you know, 
Milo Yiannopoulos to, for, to, it would be worse than Ben Shapiro, I think. Yeah, In yeah. terms of someone who is actually Cold put out. up pictures yeah. of a student, mm. a trans student at the university. At that university. At that university. Yeah, made fun to of them. bully her on yeah. stage. This is not appropriate for a university event. No. By any stretch. Yeah. Right? And, and I think there's a really strong, even in, in a way that, that centrists and people on the right can understand it in terms of free speech, there's a free speech yeah. argument to be made that it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, puts the, that person or that group of people in a position where they're unable to engage in, in that marketplace. Yeah, so, so, so free so. speech, it's except in a few weird parts of the internet, it's mm -hmm. never just anyone saying anything. Right? There's always an organization to it. Even like when you have a free speech club and you organize events, like you're choosing to amplify a particular person's speech and a particular topic. Um, yeah. And by doing that, you're sort of already, it's not politically neutral in other words. There's already a, a presumption that this person's worth listening to, people should hear what they have to say, that the topic of a debate is something that's worth discussing. Um, so, it's, it's, you know, the, what frustrates me about the free speech of def defense of bringing someone like Milo Yiannopoulos or Richard Spencer onto campus in a lot of cases would be that, you know, there's a whole lot of people who you're not bringing on. Um, you're not, you know, you're not bringing anyone to talk about structural racism in America. You're, instead, you're asking the question, should we have a white ethno state in America? And it's like, simply by deciding that's what the debate's going to be about, you've you're kind prioritizing. Of, yeah. Because we can't talk about everything. Um, in a specific given time, yeah. so there's there's an inherent you're making a hierarchy, and you almost um, when you when you prioritize certain facts or certain certain uh, topics, you are in, in like in like you must have some kind of a moral system mm. onto um, like by which to organize facts or and prioritize them. And yeah, and this I, mean, I just take this to be common sense, like. When you organize, but it's not anymore. Yeah, yeah, I, I know, I know. Sense. But like, because because you you, yeah, you you exercise discretion when you're choosing who to platform, who to bring to your yeah. event, who to what topics to debate. Yeah. Um, now there are people on the left who will take probably to extreme an opposite position, where they want to deplatform or disinvite anyone who's even slightly out of line of a particular moral and political vision of the world. Yeah. Um, and I find that can be frustrating as someone who tries to do this stuff on the left because, you know, I'll find I'll get attacked even for having, a, even for doing a video, for instance, about why I think white nationalism is wrong. And people say, like, to even have this conversation is to already legitimize this topic as something that is up for discussion. Mm -hmm. um, now, I would agree, maybe in certain circumstances, like, I think, you know, I had this reaction once when seeing an English morning news show had a doctor on to debate whether conversion therapy for gay teenagers might not actually be so bad an idea after all. And I'm like, is this really the question we should be asking right now? Um, but I think in the case of putting out, you know, material that's sort of against, for instance, white nationalism, I mean, enough people believe in this stuff that it's you sort of I'm not concerned that simply by mentioning the topic I'm going to raise awareness of this thing that's faded into nothingness because yeah. it's not it's there and it has to be dealt with it's just a question of how to deal with it well it, it, there's yeah. I've, I've noticed and trying to come to grips with this catch-22 of um, you know you ignore white nationalists and they just kind of fester mm -hmm. and do their own thing and, and maybe become more radicalized rather than you know, saving the few that are salvageable. Um, but then you engage with these ideas in the public sphere and you platform them. Uh, you are implicitly saying that these ideas are worth engaging and you are at like contributing to putting those uh, ideas in the overtone window of, of acceptable yeah. you know, public conceptions of morality and ideas that are okay. And you're shifting it to the right simply by um, acknowledging it and that is not me saying that we shouldn't engage with these ideas but I don't trust anyone who doesn't acknowledge yeah. the catch-22 in that 
So this is this, uh, this idea that sunlight is the best disinfectant. Yeah, or that, that is, it's the platitude you know, okay, on the internet. So what do we do about white nationalists? Like, well, we just bring their ideas out into the forefront. We expose them for what they are. Then everyone will see that they're bad. Okay, I agree with that. Yeah. What I don't agree with is that giving Richard Spencer a megaphone is the best way to get clarity on Richard Spencer's ideas. No, it um, really isn't. You know, Richard Spencer and people like him, I've noticed, and I had to really take the time to go deep into the annals of, mm -hmm. of alt-right YouTube and alt-right internet and, and figure out that he's really good at, uh, at making his ideas sound closer to the Overton window than it really is. Um, and, and he has a vested interest to do that because he needs to recruit people. He needs to grow his movement. Uh, I think that's... And so someone like, for example, Roaming Millennial, who basically just sat there and smiled like, huh, um, yeah, while giving it's... Richard Spencer an interview, uh, not pushing him on anything. I feel like that's that's not responsible platform. Yeah, it's become a YouTube genre. Let's interview Richard Spencer <laughs> and like not clickbait. And it's like it's frustrating because Richard Spencer wants this. So when you have when you're Richard Spencer and you think that. Your, your official policy position is that the United States should be transformed into a homogenous, ethnically white state based on the principles of national socialism. Like, you're having a, gonna have a great deal of difficulty getting mainstream. But he's not a Nazi. Of course not. <laughs> he's a alternative ethno-nationalist. Like, <laughs> but, 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 you know, you're gonna have a great deal of trouble getting on CNN. Mm, um, yeah. So, he's looking for any platform. Um, and he has acknowledged this. Yeah, yeah. In, he's in more like it. niche streams, he yeah. acknowledges, you know, I don't care if CNN or, or leftist interviewers mm -hmm. berate me and, and treat treat me terribly because at least I'm getting the ideas out there. And and, and he takes every circumstance that he can. Um, so that makes it really difficult. Um, like, do you engage with Richard Spencer at all? I personally do not. <laughs> um, for your own sanity, though. I, I think that could someone be good at it? Maybe. I mean, it, dep it depends on... Uh, some people have different talents. Some people are very good at arguing with a disingenuous person like that and making them appear, sort of exposing their mm -hmm. uh, efforts to an audience. I personally am not great at it, um, or at least not without more I don't practice. trust myself either. Yeah. Um, you know, so if you have someone who's just, like, rhetorically terrifying... You know, a kind of like Christopher Hitchens person. Fine, they can debate white nationalists and make them look dumb, but uh, it's a dangerous move, um, and it's a move that I don't even really want to attempt, especially in view of a situation where, in this case, Richard Spencer, he just is going around to YouTubers begging them to have him on his on their channel. Why? Because he's confident that any news is good news, that any platforming is good platforming, and he is sort of right. Yeah, in a and way. he's kind of right. Yeah. And if he thinks that it's going to help him. I'm inclined to believe it, and I don't want to be part of that. Yeah, I don't want to help yeah. him. That's the thing. Um, I. So you mentioned how you, just by doing an event with someone like Blair White, mm -hmm. you got a lot of shit from from a certain portion in the left. Yeah. I had a similar experience. I I tweeted out the other day. I. I simply asked Andy Worski if he had considered all the possible ramifications of hosting a debate with three Nazis on the number one trending live stream with 11,000 people watching at one point. Like, has he, not don't yeah. do it, but like, have you thought all of it through? And just asking him that got me so much shit. I am an SJW now. I don't care about free speech. You only care about free speech as long as you agree with it. And, and so that stuff comes on the right as well. You know, yeah, trying... you're simply asking him to think about what he's doing, right? Exactly. Yeah. Because from what I could tell, he wasn't. Mm -hmm. And maybe that in that moment, it wasn't the biggest deal, but it may be a big deal in the future. Um, I guess we've gone through a lot of what we were going to talk about and just kind of wrap it. <laughs> um, oh, we have a lot more. Yeah, well, I, I, I was... We kind of answered this already, but like, how to deal with the alt right? <laughs> we kind of. <laughs> well, 
Yeah, I mean, so, so here, here's one way to approach that question. When I talk to people like Andy Worski, who, YouTubers who will have alt-right figures onto their channel, um, ostensibly for the purpose of discussions or debates, often what they say is, you know, it's this sunlight is the best disinfectant argument. They say that, well, you know, if their ideas are so bad, we simply have a discussion with them and we discredit them. Um, so you say, okay, well, what happens once they're discredited? Mm -hmm. um, if the answer turns out to be that once they're discredited, no one has them on their YouTube channel anymore, why don't we just get right to that <laughs> and not have them on our YouTube channel? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if... I just if the intention yeah. is already to discredit their views, right. then why have them on in the right. first place? And it seems to me that these people, they're already widely discredited. Um, how much more discredited could these things be among, mm -hmm. you know, in like polite company? It's a <laughs> but, difficult... But like, mm -hmm. so, so I think that if we could stop gawking at them like a train accident, Mm -hmm. As a, you know, as journalists, as YouTubers, as academics, right. I think in some sense that would be a start. Yeah, like something I try to do in dealing with them is I. It, it's difficult for me because I I do agree with you, but at the same time I'm one of those people I'm super curious and I mm -hmm. and I do love watching those debates. I'm not gonna lie, because the I like. It's similar to someone who like obsessively watches documentaries on like mass murderers or serial killers. It's like you're just so fascinated by how could someone believe this and I want to understand it. So like I watch an inordinate amount of like Tara McCarthy and and uh, um, who else? Well, a bunch of people. My point is like I try to yeah. understand them. Mm -hmm so that I can debunk them, but I don't try and understand them. I, I make it a personal journey. I'm not gonna like try and understand them while I broadcast it on my channel for everyone to see. Yeah. So, well, I mean, the, I share your morbid curiosity. Um, but isn't that kind of what started some yes. of your YouTube? So, I mean, the reason I started covering the alt-right on YouTube, not to be too arrogant, but like before most, before it was a major news story. Um, and, one of the reasons that I started talking about it is that I had, you know, going back to like 2007 or something, been like a storm front lurker. Be out of just out of sheer just gawking at the, the train accident. Like I wanted to see like, oh, what are Nazis like? What do they think? Like, <laughs> what's their deal? You know? But, but, but of course I was just some person. You know, I, I wasn't putting this up on my platform. Mm -hmm. I was just voyeuristically staring into the void. And like... You were like live streaming yourself no, going through right, right, the storm. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. But... It was having done that that made me able to recognize that the sudden mainstreaming of the kind of stormfront mentality, especially when it came, you know, to about two years ago, suddenly comment sections are filled with the word cock. <laughs> and they're filled with talking talk about white genocide. All this stuff was on stormfront years ago. Mm. Um, so that kind of rang alarm bells for me. And, and you took them seriously. Yeah, I took it seriously. You, uh, uh, you, you didn't go with the, you didn't care about the people saying, oh, you can't take a joke, you don't understand yeah. shit posting, trolling, yeah. don't feed the trolls, all that stuff, you took it seriously. Yeah, well, if you go back to 2016, there was a whole attack about, oh, right, it was just a joke, it's just memes, it's just irony, it's just Pepe, lol, like, heck, <laughs> you know, hilarious. That was what they were, that was Now the they're defense. getting 300,000 you know? views on, on right, YouTube, right, right. And, and they're, they're a, an actual faction of right yeah. politics. Like so the, the, the first stage yeah. of this, right, it was incredibly frustrating trying to get anyone to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Trump won and then everyone shut up. But, <laughs> like, uh, but yeah, so I, I, see, I see what you mean. Like, there's a value, of course, in learning mm -hmm. about them. Like, I'm not saying, like, oh, we must, like, look away, avert, avert our gaze from the Nazis. But it's about how you go about learning. Like, is it worth going into alt-right forums and stuff and just reading the stuff they say? Yeah, like, I think it is. Like, I think everyone should do that, honestly. Like, go read what Nazis say. Like, um, you know, I think that's a responsible thing to do. Go read Mein Kampf. Like, that's a responsible... You heard it here first, folks. Uh, it's a <laughs> responsible thing to do, to be aware of what, you know, because more knowledge is, is good. Like, you want to know what these people are like. Mm -hmm. um, or for any group, you know. Um, but there's a line that's crossed when you start 
bringing them onto your YouTube channel, when you start hosting campus events with them, when you start um, effectively helping them spread their ideas, you mm -hmm. know, and that may not be how you view it. Not only spreading yeah. their ideas, but I think there's a there's a subtext that comes with sitting there and just hearing them out, yeah, and 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 not challenging them. There's a subtext that go that that reads as I'm. I'm somewhat sympathetic or complicit yes, in this. And yeah, yeah. maybe that subject text, that subtext usually isn't intended, mm -hmm. uh, but it is, it comes across. And I didn't believe it at first. I was yeah. very much not woke about it. Um, but I saw it happen in front of my own eyes. Um, so another thing is, I think that people can maybe take online comments a little bit more seriously. I'm not saying every single thing. Sometimes people generally are just shit posting. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people generally are, are just being ironic. But here's the thing about irony. In many circumstances, it kind of is a way of kind of dipping your toe into some belief that you actually are a little bit sympathetic towards, right? It's a way of kind of playing around with it before you go full on and and we i've seen so many of these people who kind of uh, uh like larping as 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 alt writers and and being ironic and shit posting become that right yeah. and so we should take that seriously and maybe like quit the oh it's just trolling right um what do you think of that yeah i think that for some people these jokes the, and memes can be a way of like experimenting with an idea yeah. or sort of just seeing how they feel expressing it. Um, it's also, you know, an idea that they know is very socially not acceptable and that's a kind of safer way to do it as a joke because you can say things as a joke that you can't say sincerely, right? Um, like, that, one of the reasons why comedy is so often evoked as a defense, even when what's being defended isn't really comedy. Um, no. So you see... This is something that happens often. Someone's but then they say comedy yeah. is subjective, so anything uh -huh. is comedy. Everything's comedy, yeah. right? So you say something racist, then people get mad at you. You say, oh, it's just a joke. Um, well, it's kind of a cop-out, isn't it? I mean, you can say anything, it was just a joke. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you know, sometimes it, it, is, it is just a joke. But sometimes people are... There is no punchline whatsoever. <laughs> like, uh, And in the case of... I guess that's a little bit different from deliberately using it. But I do think people also would deliberately kind of, it's, it's a tactic of obfuscation, right? Mm -hmm. These, the memes, the Pepe, the, it's to put up on a front of the whole thing is incredibly trivial. It's just for laughs. Um, and you know, I'm not just making this up. Like you can find Richard Spencer saying the exact same thing. Like that's what he, that's what he says about what he's doing. Mm -hmm. um, he, yeah, yeah. About, yeah. Or encouraging, not, not he's yeah. doing, because he's not the mastermind of this. Like, we give him way too much credit around here, but like... No, he, he's just kind yeah, of like the he's, archetypal he's, he's white up, nationalist. Yeah. He's picked up the kind of like internet energy. They say, ooh, we can use this. Oh, look what 4chan came up with. Let's, let's get that in here, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I kind of, maybe we should switch gears a little bit. Sure. Um, and talk about trans activism. Mm -hmm. um, because that's something we are both in a sense doing whether we want to or not uh, whether we mean to or not I yeah. think we can't really deny that we're doing some form of activism when we're public trans public figures that talk about trans issues in a sympathetic way um, and so on so I think it's important to figure out how do we best make the world better for trans people uh, how how do we go about it and how have we been going about it so far and has it been good? That's well, a lot I think that, you know, no one person can do that much, but my individual approach to this has been, you could simply do a lot by just being trans and then being visible. And you don't even have to be doing activism, just doing things, creating a public character uh, of yourself that people can sort of empathize with on some level. Mm. Um, you know, I did this, I did a video called Gender Dysphoria, which is not an argument or a debate. It's just like a series of like little vignettes that are supposed to convey something about what gender dysphoria is like. Mm -hmm. And that, I hope, because for some people, it's just like, it's enough to just be respected, right? Like, I just want people to use my pronouns. I, I just want them to allow me to exist. I'm not satisfied with that. I want to be understood. And like... We, like, uh, as we all do. And, yeah. and, and I, I think... 
Well, that's the thing, right? You, you, um, you know, you can agree or disagree with the idea of a minimum wage. I know, you know, but you know, or, or, or like a fifteen dollar minimum wage, whether that's too much. But the idea, like you, you push the minimum fifteen dollar minimum wage over and over and over and over again, and you act, you, you, you get uh, politicians to talk about it, and then you eventually end up with you know a twelve dollar minimum wage, yeah. which is much better than a nine dollar minimum wage, and so. Should we be asking for more so that we get, you know, rather than being compromising and then just getting nowhere? So should we be making optimistic demands in the hopes of... But also sure, strong yeah. and, yeah. Uh, like, uncompromising demands, in a sense. Like, certain things we're not compromising on. Yes, I think that's probably true. I think that... As long as you, I mean, you can afford not to compromise on some basic things, then you shouldn't. Um, For example, I would never compromise the idea that, okay, fine, trans women or men. I would never. Like, in no circumstance. Um, but there are some... What does that mean to you? Like, how far would you go to stop someone from saying that? It's not that I would stop someone from yeah. saying that. I just wouldn't ever compromise to that point. To the point of associating with them, or...? Of saying, okay, well, as long as you use... I'm saying it's okay that you do that. It's okay that you think that trans women are men. Yeah. Yeah, that that's okay. Um, so, we're kind of subtweeting here. <laughs> we are <laughs> subtweeting. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, someone like Blair White does kind of really There's lower... That. The, lower the, <laughs> she really does... <laughs> She really lowers the bar in terms of, like, she will sit there and have Ben Shapiro tell her, you're a man uh, and you're just, you just look like a woman. Uh, and that, for that reason, I'm going to call you he and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, so this is not... And so my question is, yeah. does that actually, that kind of super compromising, does that make some of the really far, dying the wool bigots just make them a little bit more tolerant? Does the Blair yeah. White... Have strategy have any effect if you want to do gay rights activism other than making her money you don't <laughs> do it by trying to ingratiate yourself with the Westboro Baptist Church like the point the culture can move well beyond what Ben Shapiro thinks and his opinions are irrelevant so trying to you can create a little niche for yourself as a conservative trans person or as a conservative whatever minority group you always have food on the plate if you're willing to do that but if you're, you know, if, if, as you say, if you're willing to compromise to the extent where you're like, oh yeah, sure, you can call me a man as long as uh, <laughs> the paycheck keeps coming in. Like, that, no, that's not helpful to anyone but you. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, there's an argument that she would be, oh, she's creating this understanding with Ben Shapiro. I mean, the argument would have to be that Ben Shapiro is now more likely to treat trans people better in the future because we said he could treat them badly now. <laughs> which I find implausible implausible and, and I think that there's a degree to which um, I don't know if it universalizes when it comes to people who are that kind of transphobic mm -hmm. as a lot of Ben Shapiro's audience a lot, not all I know there are some great Shapiro fans I'm, I see you um, <laughs> but a lot uh, it's like, do you really inspire people to be more accepting of trans people or be more accepting of you? Like, people are great at compartmentalizing, right? It doesn't necessarily universalize. And then you yeah. have this cushy position as the one trans person that they're willing to tolerate with a thin veneer of acceptance. Well, there's something to be said for the idea that creating sympathy for one individual tends to become potentially generalizable. Yeah. Like, how many people do I know who have told me that my coming out as trans or my being in their life as a trans person has, like, transformed what they thought about trans people? Um, and I've heard the same from other people who say, like, they just did not get it until someone they knew came out as trans or someone they knew transitioned. And I think that being that person in their life, you know, can have a transformative effect. Yeah. So I don't want to completely trivial or completely disparage the notion that having some conservative trans people around could possibly open up a little bit of um, understanding in circles yeah. where that might not otherwise find it. Like probably it can, but this is enhanced, this is achieved simply by being trans in those spaces. Yeah. It's not aided by the kind of attempting to make political concessions 
or trying to give to away when, your own sense of entitlement to basic root politeness, uh, I don't see that as helpful in any way. Okay. Yeah, that's a, I think that was a really good discussion on how to move forward. Um, certain things don't compromise on, know what your principles are, but beyond that, try to, you know, uh, I guess, be reasonable in a sense. Don't. There are some trans activists that are pretty crazy. Um, for example, last year, um, the uh, Vancouver Women's Library opened in February. They had all kinds of books in the library, including trans exclusionary radical feminists, um, but they also had a bunch of authors that were super trans affirmative, right? But they were convinced, uh, these trans activists were convinced that, uh, that uh, it was run by TERFs and they, they were um, like tearing up pages of books, they were yelling, they were at the opening of this library. Um, and I think that's, that's really like, I would go to that library and I'd be like, I, I, I don't speak for all trans people, but on behalf of like reasonable trans people, I'm sorry that they did that to you because that is not okay. So I'm cautious about telling this kind of crazy trans activists type story. Uh -huh. um, do some activists behave in ways that are, to say the least, bad optics? Yes. Um, but does, they, aren't they just also admittedly un, being unreasonable? No? Um, in so some I cases? think oftentimes the sense of outrage comes from a place of, that I think is, where the outrage, outrage is justified. But I think that it can be expressed in ways that are unproductive, that do not really do anything but appease a kind of emotional drive. Mm -hmm. um, and is that sometimes a problem? Yes, it can become, like I said, an optics problem. Yeah. Um, but it's also incredibly difficult when you have a media environment or journalists who like to tell this story. They do. Again. So the, yeah, on the one yeah. hand, like yes, there are activists who go about things in a very counterproductive way. But on the other hand, there are a lot of journalists who are so obsessed with this, they're more interested in crazy trans activists as a story than they are in trans rights as a story. Because it sells, yeah. right? Yeah. It, it's reminiscent of, you know, you know, one person, you know, trans people have existed for as long as humans have, mm -hmm. basically, um, as far as we can tell, and that's no surprise. And then there's this one person who Rachel Dolezal, and they 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 they, they, they co-op the trans yeah. issue and call it, oh transracial okay yeah. let's all tra talk about this one person yeah. in the history of everything yeah. and uh, then by calling it trans something or trans species or trans able drawing this uh, transphobic meta like metaphysical equivalence mm -hmm. uh, between the two where there isn't any. I, I was saying this in a live stream once. You can you can uh, go from one state to another and call it trans something. Like I I I earlier today I didn't have makeup on. Then I put makeup on. I'm not trans beauty. Trans cosmetic. <laughs> yeah, trans cosmetic. Yeah. Uh, it, you can yeah. put a label like that on anything, and it's like you choose to put those labels on there because it sells and because people want those biases confirmed of like, oh, this is what's gonna happen now. Now we're gonna have people. You know, identifying as, you know, slices of cheese or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So, I mean, it seems like the issue with the journalists covering the crazy trans people is that the story, trans, you know, here's, here are the, here's the dilemma that trans people are in. Here's the this, this problems they face in society. This is, in a sense, as a media consumer, a difficult story. It's a story that asks you to think about why things are bad. It's a story that potentially asks you to change how you think and change how you behave. That's hard, and people don't like that. The story, these crazy activists are making unreasonable demands. That's easy as a story because it tells you, I'm fine, it's the people who are complaining that are the problem. So, do you think there's some, for that reason, that there's something inherently conservative about normie or mainstream culture? Um, like that kind of well, puts it slightly to the side yeah. in, in a I mean, sense. I want to like put nail down something a little more specific than like normies, but like no, uh, <laughs> popular culture. But, yeah, yeah. People that don't like do what you and I do in yeah. this do I think, corner of YouTube. Do I think that the, the mainstream media? Yeah, I think that there's um, to a lot of reporting on these issues, there is a kind of conservative bent, um, especially in the fascination with 
the deranged activists, right? Yeah. As a as a news story, is just something that I find becomes an excuse not to think about the issues. So I'm the next YouTube video I'm working on is about kind of an old controversy within uh, the kind of relation between academics and trans people and it's like journalists. niche upon niche upon yeah. niche of a topic. I know, I know. It's, 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 it's a lot of topic to explain, but I hope it's going towards somewhere. Like, so, basically, there's a, it's a controversy that goes back to 2003 with the publication of this book called The Man Who Would Be Queen by Michael Bailey, um, which proposed a bad theory of what it is to be a trans woman yeah. um, and a theory that sort of misrepresents us in ways that are kind of stigmatizing. Um, yeah. And there's a kind of and just incorrect, whether it's stigmatizing yes. or not. Um, there was a massive backlash against Bailey and against this book that came from trans activists and trans people. And, you know, there's been su subsequently many articles and books written about the controversy, often talking about how unfair Bailey was treated yeah. and how crazy and awful these trans activists are. Um, so is there some truth to that, perhaps? But also, Bailey still has his job. He's doing fine. Yeah, and he does. And no one has paid attention to the fact in, in, in this, the coverage of this story, what's been lost is the fact that this theory was wrong mm -hmm. and that it's actually quite stigmatizing and damaging to trans people. So there really was something there that the activists were mad about in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it's like, uh, you know, and the, and the case is, I think, the same with... Um, any number of these like uh, recent events. I mean, this is just becoming a very repetitive news story, right? Um, white cis male college professor between the ages of 35 and 70 says a thing that's offensive. A bunch of SJWs get angry about it. Uh, free speech is under attack. News papers go up. Um, you know, but in a lot of these cases, in a lot of these cases, yeah, do the, do the activists misbehave sometimes? Do they do they mix half truths and exaggerations along with genuine criticisms? Yes. Uh, do you think that's a bad thing? That they mix half-truths and exaggerations? Well, that's a bad yes. thing. <laughs> yes, I do. But, you know, if you look at these people, most of them have their jobs. Many of them are much more wealthy and influential than they were before they were silenced by SJWs. I mean, how is Jordan Peterson doing? Like, is he on the streets? Like, last I checked, his Patreon was around 50K a month. Like, yeah. he's doing fine. You know, he's being silenced. Turns out to be very profitable. And, like... You know, the initial controversy that erupted was about him refusing to use a non-binary student's pronouns, which... Well, it wasn't an actual student. Okay, a hypothetical, yeah. Yeah. Which actually is something that he's wrong about. So, man is wrong, people overreact, person, wrong person becomes lionized and, and, you know, and defended in the name of sticking it to these crazy activists. This, this is a story that's becoming very t tedious to me. Um, and it's a, it's a story that people often, you know, journalists, they don't want to talk about me unless they want to talk about this kind of thing. All journalists want to talk to me about is, tell me about your crazy, I mean, that's how we started this event off. Tell me about your crazy audience. Like, what is it with those crazy trans people that follow you? Like, how let's talk about that. It's all anyone wants to talk about. It's frustrating. Yeah, because you, you feel like they're not asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. You're not, they're not asking the important questions. Yeah, there's questions. a single the mind. That right, because the thing is, like, am, like, are some leftists on the internet like unreasonable? Yes, the people, I mean, I'm sitting around here having myself accused of Holocaust denial and, you know, preposterous things. But I try, I don't let myself get so obsessed with that that I lose my sight of the fact that there's more important political and moral struggles going on right now. Like, and it's annoying to me that so much of the storytelling that goes on around these events is obsessed with telling the same crazy activist story again and again. Yeah. That is true. Where are we at? Shall we start the Q&A? Shall we take a 15 minute break and then start the Q&A? No? Lewis says yes. Lewis says yes? <laughs> okay. Perfect. All right. We can take a 15 minute break. Stretch your legs. And you can give us a round of applause. <laughs> We'll, we'll start the Q&A session at 8.15, and I would also like to remind you that the, the donation box is right over there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, enjoy your break. I'll see you at 
This is going to be a bit of ramble. Um, so there's usually years of activism up before a moment happens in which society accepts something as a whole. So gay, gay activism, some could even say it started at like the turn of the 20th century. And then there was a point where some figurehead will step out and it will be useful because even your mom can agree with it. So like one could say gay activism had a point in which Ellen came out. And that was a useful moment, despite it not being most of the moments. It was a point in which society took a turn. Uh, with tran transgender politics at the fore, there's, there sort of has been a much more imperfect thing with like Caitlyn Jenner, a person with really regressive politics, but also coming out. So do you think we've hit that moment and we're on the other side of it? Or do you think you're working up to that moment and what will it look like? So I wouldn't expect it always to go the same way with whatever kinds of activism we're doing. So I think looking around for who's the trans Ellen is probably not necessary because there's not any reason why there's going to be someone who's just like that. I mean, with Caitlyn Jenner, you know, we have someone who was famous um, before anyone was aware of it. She was trans. Um, and someone whose politics are not super, I mean, I think, does it have an effect? Yeah, people now all know at least one trans person because of the celebrity of Caitlyn. Um, and that's like something, it's not the whole thing, but it's like a moment of, of public awareness. Um, so I think that looking for perfect analogs to other movements is, is not necessarily, we can't sit around expecting it to be exactly the same, but there are going to be some similarities, yeah. Sorry, in the hat? No fun? <laughs> okay, so this might be more for Theron, but I think for both of you, despite like both countries having fairly different legal and cultural approaches to free speech, it seems like both Canada and the United States are sort of having the same Try, all have a lot of the same talking points in the on the ground discussions. Do you think that's justified? And what do you think like the difference in the conversations should be? So the question is, explain Canada. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Canada, obviously, we do we do have hate speech, uh, hate speech laws. Uh, you can't you know, advocate genocide. There are protected groups. Uh, there are limitations to your free speech. Um, you can't incite, you know, incite violence, um, and it's it's not quite as uh, it's not quite as free speech absolutist as in the U.S. So yeah, I think you're right that the conversation should be a little bit different, right? Um, I mean, in the U.S. at the moment, so much of the conversation about trans, you know, politics is about like stopping these like n negative things from happening. It's the ban, the bathroom bills, the military ban, right? Like mm -hmm. it's because of the nature of the current administration, the, it's like all d defense and damage control and trying to prevent things from getting worse. Um, whereas in Canada, maybe it's, not, it's more of a, you can afford to sort of be climbing upwards instead of just raising the shields. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, Canada, even in its, in its law, is a little bit more uh, social justice oriented, you could yeah, say, in definitely. a sense. Uh, we have those protected groups, um, and uh, and it's kind of how Canada, you know, does its thing, basically. Um, there's an argument to be made that, it, like, if you don't like it, don't live here, kind of thing. Uh, I don't know, like, because there are... <laughs> there, there's a, that, that is an argument. It's maybe not a very good one, but some people hate the fact that, that Canada is more kind yeah. of social justice oriented. Uh, like... Our Overton window just is more to the left, naturally, uh, which I actually like. You know, Canada has given me so many opportunities that I would never have had 
um, if I stayed in South Africa, for example. So I, I can't I can't fault them for that um, in many ways. Um, question was, should we be having a different conversation? Well, yes. Um, I, I, I do think that we should in terms of the legality and the history and the culture because it's different. It is different, you know. Um, I think that, yeah, my answer is yes, but not too much than that right now because my brain is a little bit fried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think uh, this is a bit of an open-ended question. Um, uh, you were talking earlier in your talk about people like um, Jordan Peterson and J. Michael Bailey and how they're wrong, but they still get this platform and it, they go on with their lives perfectly well. And I also notice in online spaces, especially online spaces with marginalized people, it's like when you're wrong, you're wrong and you're screwed. And so it's kind of like, it's like, and I'm, maybe this is an open-ended question to sort of the free speech club in general, but I think the idea of free speech could really be about the space to be able to be wrong and then grow from that. And so in like online communities, uh, how can we create the space for people of all different walks of life to be wrong and what's the roadmap to that? And also, because like, if you don't create that roadmap for people to be wrong, the other people who you know, they straight white male, obviously. They get to be wrong and go off and have their own platform. And the reason they get to do that is because the marginalized people have less than low standards for them, whereas we have really high standards for people who are marginalized. And, and yeah, so how do we go and create that roadmap of being able to be wrong and grow? That's a Really Sorry, I'm really interesting trying to concern. Um, yeah. I like the way you put it about the like, sort of right of freedom to be wrong. Because it's something that I feel like I have lost in the last <laughs> six months. Um, that is, when I first started making content online, like not that many people were paying attention to what I did. So I could just like fuck up all the time, and like I did. And like you know, you make a bad take on Twitter, people will tell you you're wrong, and you learn that that was a bad take. Yeah. I don't get to make bad takes on Twitter anymore because too many people follow me, and if I say something stupid, it like ruins my week. <laughs> so uh, I have, I, I feel like there's a lot of things I want to talk about that I don't fully understand, but that I feel like I cannot publicly talk about simply because my online platform, middling though it is, is already too big to do this. Um, so how do we do it? I don't know, do you have any ideas? Well, it is something that I can relate to a lot because I have been very wrong on a lot of things <laughs> online. Um, and, you know, for example, like I'm like planning on making an apology video uh, sometime next week and um, basically I'm going to talk about like how I've not spoken about non-binary people in the right way and I've, I've, I've uh, kind of contributed to... Uh, the shit that they have to deal with already, and, and I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. Um, I guess, but I do still have this fear because I know I've said and done things online that have hurt people. Um, and a lot of people have, I, I'm kind of a, a reformed shitlord, really. <laughs> um, and and I, I sympathize with where they were coming from because I came from there as well. And, 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 and like my question is like I hope people will somehow understand and that but but I do have this fear that I was wrong and, and I was publicly wrong and that had some ramifications that weren't good. So will that for be held against me? I'm not sure. And uh, I would hope that it's not because I, I think that the world needs more people like me. <laughs> Yeah, that's I, that's not really an answer to the question, but it was open ended, so I guess I'm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, I was wondering if um, if Dave Rubin ever left his <laughs> echo chamber, uh, would you uh, would either of you ever go on his show, and how do you think like that would work out? 
Well, till, I mean, the, on my channel has been kind of an ongoing joke about me trying to go on his show. <laughs> <laughs> like, for the time being, I kind of don't do anything like that. Like, I've just been turning all these things down because I just don't feel like dealing with it. Um, I hope I get to a point where I sort of get over that. Ruben and I may make an exception for it because it's been such a trope that I feel like if anyone gave me trouble for that, I could simply point them to everything I've ever said about him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I would go on his show, but I once called him out for being an echo chamber, and I think that's kind of put, takes you off of his list. He's considered having me on, and I think he actually decided <clears throat> not to have me on anymore because I told him, I'm tired of your echo chamber, please. You, t you talk about how you want your show to be about big ideas and, um, and, and, and how it's this free speech platform. There's this big gap, like have people like Natalie on, have Kyle uh, Zielinski, Kalinski, a uh, guy from Secular Talk, have David Destiny. Packman, have Destiny on, uh, have uh, Sam Cedar or um, his co-host. Michael Brooks. Have people like that on and, and then, you know, and, and I, I kind of called them out on Twitter, which maybe that's not the best way of doing yeah, it. Yeah, you gotta stop that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but yeah, so basically, probably not going to ever go on his channel because I called him out on it, which is, you know, maybe I deserve it. Yeah. Um, I should learn to, like, not tweet, so... <laughs> you, ha you have to learn it by Pavlovian conditioning. Like, it's just, like, it, we, once you get to the point where even the thought of tweeting makes you panic, like, <laughs> you've, been, you've been trained. <laughs> So um, we were talking earlier about like Ellen as this sort of public figure for the gay rights movement, but there's um, particularly in the trans movement, there's this interesting thing where um, you know if you're looking for role models or just representatives, it's if you're a racial minority or if you're a woman, that's obvious. Or even if you're gay, there was obviously a long phase where most people were closeted, but it was it, it was expressed. But the trans community has the concept of basically stealth. It's you know, I'm a man or a woman, whatever, and like I should just be treated that way and like almost erase the fact that I'm trans from history. Um, do you feel like that's going to fade or uh, that that was a good thing, bad thing? What are your sort of feelings around the subject of stealth, um, particularly with regards to giving people either a role model or example of, you know, uh, community? Well, there are a lot of trans people who were living their lives stealth mm -hmm. and were not at all happy about trans activism having its big like moment or whatever was going on. Um, they were perfectly happy without anyone poking around and thinking about this too much. Um, and I sort of get why they would feel that way because I can understand that you know you feel like I'm done with this. I don't want to think about it anymore. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I feel my personal feeling about this is that it's necessary. If this is going to be a movement of any kind at all, if you're going to organize for your interests, for your uh, recognition, for your rights, you kind of have to name yourself. Mm -hmm. And that means not being stealth. Um, at least, you know, you can be stealth at McDonald's. But like, <laughs> you, you know, don't, it means not being stealth on, on the platform, on Twitter, on whatever. Well, a stealth person is one less trans, like, uh, it's one less trans person that exists, because mm -hmm. nobody knows that person's trans, mm -hmm. right? Um, I would like to... They exist. Sorry? They exist, but as far they, as... No, they're well, in the minds of yeah. other people, like, uh, like if you don't, like, out of sight, out of mind, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I would have to think about these things. Obviously, they exist. Mm -hmm. um, but my point is that I would like to live in a society where trans people don't have to be stealth and not exist in order mm -hmm. to exist. That would be nice. And I'm not saying we're like we're getting there and we've made a lot of progress and yeah, so it's not like dire straits yeah. quite. I know for some people and in some cases, like South Africa is absolutely not great. Um, you know, it's anyway, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> Can I choose a question? I mean for it, Choose. Okay. Hey. Just speaking to this? Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Franz Kurtzke. I'm a fourth year philosophy student here at uh, UBC. I've been 
I think fair to say, very involved in the free speech activism on this campus. Uh, and I have a question for you. You've sort of, please be patient, it's going to take a couple words to get this out. So you've talked about, you met, just briefly mentioned gender neutral pronouns. And you also talked about, you were a little bit critical, I think, about uh, Jordan Peterson. So, um, very briefly, I, I started a theater course recently, an elective course here at UBC. And I think it's important to keep talking about why, what we're talking about. I'm here for the same reason a lot of people are, which is that I think there's something like a free speech movement being created on the campuses. And I think the reason for that is that young men in particular, although there's wonderful, many wonderful red-pilled women here tonight, thank you, um, are, 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 are kicking back for the right, you mentioned that it's not always, that there's a content when you're talking about free speech. And the content for me, and for a lot of people I think, it's the right to criticize the distortions and the excesses and some of the technical inaccuracies in the narrative of Do you third. Have a question? Yeah, well. Okay, ask it. Okay, well. Life's complex, you know. Uh, you're not there. You're asking questions. Ask them a question. Yeah, he was. I'm sorry. I've been diagnosed on the autism spectrum of several times. That might be the issue. Sure. Let just let him, let him finish the question. I, I'm trying to make a point sensitively. Uh, because there's, 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 there's different groups here. There's free speechers, there's people who are trans, there's different kind of metaphysical assumptions. But here's, fine. We you want me to be, in, that yeah, you want me to be, be blunt, so I'll put it out blunt. Here's the deal. I think that we're not talking about, enough about the campus issues, because this is a talk having on the campus in the middle of a kind of a culture war. And at the core of that are issues, let's use one example, gender neutral pronouns. Okay, is that, is that satisfying? So, so the, the, ask, me, yeah, ask me the question. Yeah, sorry. So what I, what I wanted to ask you about is this. My thought on this, so I was in the theater course and we start the course, it's about culture, and we start the question, I want this to be a safe space, says the professor. I want all you to give your pronouns as we introduce each other, says the professor. So the question is with situations like that, I want to ask your questions about policy and culture of how we're going to move forward with this. The reason why I think this matters is because trans individuals, biological males, biological females, who identify with the other side, and that's, yeah, again, it's a touchy issue, right? I don't want to upset people. Can we get to the question, please? Can we get to the question, please? I am asking a question. We are waiting. The, the question is, how are we going to deal with this? Because for me, Using she, using her, these kind of things to refer to biological males, biological females who, who identified with or aspired to be the other side was a previous societal accommodation. It was a kindness, it was a generosity. But it does not change their evolutionary biological status as uh, technically biologically male or female. So do we, uh, do we and so the question the theory is, of evolution, yeah gain traction. Yeah. People use gendered pronouns without any difficulty, um, without any awareness of the formal role of sex in human evolution. Mm -hmm. I don't think that evolutionary biology pertains to the use of pronouns in the English language in any respect. I, 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 I'm, <laughs> but, but people, people mix gender and sex all the time, and I think that's a mistake. Sex, I think, is what pronouns refer to. And when you use alternate sex pronouns for people who are trans, okay. that is a generosity. That is a kindness so on extended what basis by do you society. Think that's, in what situations does sex determine what pronouns you use? In what situations? Yes. The situation of being biologically born into one sex or the other. Okay. So what is biological sex? Chromosomes? Well, there are, again, there are fine distinctions there, but most of the time that's not what we're talking about when we're well, talking about gender neutral pronouns. Well, there's fine distinctions. Yeah, so, so the I mean, you don't, I don't check yeah. your blood to make sure yeah. you're X, Y before yeah. like, I don't like, I don't say, like, pull down your pants, everyone. Yeah. I don't know what pronouns are. Like, you know, but like, there's a certain, yeah. like, there, 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 there will be chances. Yeah. There, there will be yeah. chances yeah. I'll, end, I'll end the topic. So, so the, the final question for you to leave with you, Lewis. Yes, Lewis? There will be time after to speak one-on-one when it comes to these 
long conversation. Sure. There, for the interest of time and for the other people who have questions, we'll move on. Hi there. Um, one of the arguments I hear on the for free speech absolutism is the idea that, for example, if you were to have like a KKK rally, you also have like an anti-white supremacist counter rally that can many many times overpower and overpower that and show the message that the, of solidarity against that. So, what would would you say that's a valid message, and would would you have any any counter to that particular argument? Sorry, is the argument that you? Like, the, if there's like a, if the, like, for example, if there's like a white supremacist, like KKK rally, and you have like the, the print, although the, they're, 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 the idea that if there is like an extremist movement, there's often like a counter movement which even overpowers it, that's sort of like, um, the, the argument for like the free speech absolutism is that if you have like a counter movement that's even more powerful, in the end, if you're, the, the fact that the KKK has a platform, it, it diminishes like its, its, its harms ultimately? Yeah, so of course I think that if there's going to be a KKK rally, get as many people as you can to do the counter rally. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you have to invite the KKK to your living room to give a speech to your, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to invite the KKK on campus. Um, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I already have anything to say about that, <laughs> sorry. I'm kind of running out of steam, to be honest. <laughs> this is mainly for Natalie. Um, it bridges a lot of the different kinds of things that have been touched on already, including representation, as well as the alt-right, as well as uh, may maybe trying to be too perfect. Uh, so just and referencing your views about one of the characters you've created, Tabby. Uh, so I, I know that you, you've mentioned that you think that Tabby is liked a lot because of just the appeal of a cat girl. Uh, but I, I find Tabby interesting and, and appealing because Tabby's someone that would stand up physically to protect people from fascists and neo-Nazis and the alt-right in general. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's a need to have more of like a Mary Sue, like a perfect character that has good arguments as well as being willing to do those kinds of things to try to give somebody representation that they can look up to that's, that's not as flawed as, as the way that Tabby is right now. Yeah, so I personally, I mean, I do think there's, yeah, is there a role for Mary Sue's, especially a trans Mary Sue, does the world need that? Probably. I am reluctant to make it myself because I personally find that kind of character boring. And the persona I present of myself on YouTube is a persona that has some of my flaws built into it. Um, you know, So I think that to me, I try to make videos that I would wanna watch. And to me, part of what's interesting about a persona on the internet is feeling like a real person is on the other end, a real person who makes mistakes and gets too drunk too often, and you know, <laughs> uh, th th you know th things like this. I find it more interesting in a kind of host than a perfect narrator. Um, as far as Tabby, yeah, I think you're right that people, what pe people. So Tabby is a character that I invented on my channel, who's an Antifa cat girl, who goes around with a bat talking about smashing fascists, and the character was sort of intended as a caricature of. Left, young leftist activists with no capacity to convey their ideas effectively to other people. By su somewhat to my surprise, much of my audience just loved this character unironically. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that part of it has, to, you know, I, I think people don't understand how scary the alt right is to a lot of trans people or to people of color or to. Uh, you know, a lot of these groups I feel just directly physically intimidated by that. And so to have a character who's, you know, it, it, it seemed weird to me that they would want to be represented by this irrational, violent person. But I think just having that his character, like physical presence is, you know, it seems to mean something. Yeah. Would there be, I think we might have time for one more question. Would that be okay? Order. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, one last one. <laughs> I have a quick one. Uh, how often do people come to either of you saying, 
I was going the way of the alt right, or I was going in a very negative direction, maybe with hate, and your sort of speaking to me as a person helped me turn in a different direction, went towards a little bit more compassion. Very often. In my case, well, with the alt-right, I haven't spoken too much about the alt-right. It's something that I, that I kind of plan on talking more about this year. Um, so not so much that, but I have a, a lot of people like, like you've kind of red-pilled me on trans people. <laughs> blue, pink pill, blue pill, <laughs> pink pill, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, but that I've changed their minds and, and uh, that they understand trans people for who they are um, much better. Yeah.